time of praise. Mighty God, we worship you. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your provision, oh God. Oh, there's none else like you in all the heavens and the earth. And we're so excited about the opportunity to be in this house right now to give them praise. Can we give them just one more hand clap right now? Mighty God, we worship you. We praise you. We magnify your holy name, oh God. So wonderful. I'm as excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We would just take a moment and let's greet our neighbors and tell them it's good to see you in the house of the Lord.
As we make our way back to our seats, I'm as excited to be in the house of the Lord. How many came tonight with an expectation in your spirit that God was going to do something awesome in this service tonight? Ah, so glad to be among God's people. We've got just a few announcements. If you're watching online right now, we are so glad that you're joining us, and we're glad that you're going to be a part of what uh, what, we're, what God is doing here tonight. Um, if you have a prayer request, uh, we welcome you to enter that into the chat box on the website or on Facebook if you're watching there. And we want to uh, we want to include you. We want to join together with you uh, in your prayer request. Uh, attention, young people and parents. The youth group is going to be attending the Alabama Youth Convention, which is held at the Sheraton at the end of this month. Uh, the registration is $40, uh, which is due this Sunday, uh, January 17th. Please see uh, Sister Brianna uh, for that payment, as well as if you have any questions, uh, you want to, uh, to see her about that. And also, we are still uh, giving online on the website uh, or on our app, the Church Center app. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are faithful in our giving and our tithing. Um, and so we want to uh, we want to do that. Let's pray over the offering right now. Mighty God, we love you. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your provision, God. We thank you for this offering, God, for the bed of your kingdom, God. Move in this service in the name of Jesus. Amen.
the house tonight. As they're singing about a breakthrough, I just, I feel a witness in my spirit. I feel it touching back to Sunday service, prophetic words that went forth in this house. And I feel like we're, I feel like we're stepping into a season of breakthroughs. Is there a witness? Does anybody else feel that in your spirit? There's a, lot, there's a lot going on in the world today, but I feel like this is a special time for the children of God. I feel like this is a special season for the house of God. And right now, for just a few minutes, can you just stay in this, this vein of worship? And just whatever that breakthrough is that you're looking for tonight, why don't you go ahead and just, just put a little praise on it. Just put a little worship on it. Just go ahead and somebody shout before the wall comes down. But it feels good in the house. It feels like victory in the house. And I think we as the children of God need to just take a minute right now and go ahead and just rejoice for what God's about to bring your way. Somebody go ahead and just shout for what God is about to do in your home, in your family, in your body, in your finances. Oh, somebody's going to have a breakthrough in the spirit in 2021. You're going to go to a place you've never been before. You're going to see things you've never seen before. Saints of God are going to lay their hands on people and they're going to talk in tongues at Walmart. They're going to talk in tongues in the parking lot. People are going to get out of
I'll go ahead and just turn this sanctuary into your prayer room. The Holy Ghost is moving. The Spirit of God is moving. Come on, just go ahead and treat this sanctuary as your prayer room this morning, this evening. I, I sense, I could feel my Savior right now as he moves through the house and he wants to be close. He wants to draw close to us. So just open up your heart, open up your spirit to him right now. Let's just draw close to the Lord as they sing.
Stand in for Brother Blash really quick. And some of you young men lay your hands on Brother Jermaine. And Brother Kedrick, why don't you go ahead and stand in for KJ tonight? Some of you gentlemen, lay your hands on Brother Kedrick. KJ's mother passed away yesterday. It was kind of a sudden thing out of nowhere. So pray for him and his siblings and that family. They need the peace and the strength of God. Just pray God will be a comfort for him in this time. God, if you believe God hears and he answers prayer, go ahead and begin to praise him and magnify him tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus, mighty, mighty God. We praise you, we worship you, we lift you up. Blessed be the name above every name. Has he been good to you? Is there a witness in the house that God is always God? He never fails. Has he answered your prayer? Did he redeem you? Has he changed your life? Has he blessed your home? Is he a good God? Is he worthy tonight? Praise God. I love the presence of God that we feel. It's a wonderful Wednesday night in the house of the Lord. And we are a blessed people to be a part of what God is doing in the earth. And I just tell you, it's um, there are interesting situations on every hand but we are standing on the firm foundation of the word of god and we're standing in the covenant of the everlasting king and we know that his kingdom is ascending and that it will fill the whole earth and that it will last forever and all the other kingdoms are coming down don't get too closely tethered to these earthly kingdoms because they'll rattle your cage when they start coming apart and they'll They'll sink your heart and your spirit if your heart and spirit are tied up with them. You have to keep your eye on the things of God and be uh, connected with Him at a, at a level that's higher than everything else around you. Can you say amen? Love what God is doing. I appreciate the presence of God in the house tonight and all the ministry groups that come together to make, uh, to make this possible. And we're just 
we're just expecting God to move in a great way in 2021. You want to remember Friday evening at 7, we'll have a communion service here. We won't have the, uh, uh, the annual foot washing, but we'll have our uh, communion service. And what we'll do is just utilize these nice Church of Christ pews and put the uh, communion in the little holes there in front of you, the little bookcase communion cup holders and and then we'll come together and talk about the wonderful thing that God did when he came to the earth in the form of a man and then we'll participate in communion together and we'll uh, and we'll kick off a good year. If you didn't hear or if you're not a part of it yet, this is a great week for fasting. It's a there are no great weeks for fasting, but if this were a great week for fasting, it would be good cuz it's the first week of the year. Kick the thing off in high fashion and uh, take a look in the mirror and just say die flesh die and when your stomach goes to rumbling go into the kitchen and find a pot that's cooking and pick up the lid and smell the aroma and say die flesh die and uh, you know you get it so uh, uh, take control of yourself early on in the year because there are good things that are waiting and some things just don't happen except by prayer and fasting so if you want to go a little higher, if you want to be a little better, if you want to see a little more clearly, then you need to get less of you and more of him. Somebody say amen. And you're about as excited about fasting as I am. But it's, uh, it's one of those wonderful things that God has given us to help us to draw close to him. We're going to read tonight in uh, 1 Samuel 26 again, verse 7. We left off here last uh, Wednesday evening. Appreciate the good ministry in the pulpit Sunday. Brother uh, Stephen did an absolutely wonderful job, and we appreciate what God is doing in him. So David and Amishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster, his bedroll, his saddle. But Abner and the people lay round about him, and then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I'll not smite him the second time. And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. On his day, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is in his bolster and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away, and no man saw it nor knew it, neither awakened, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. If you love his word tonight as you're seated, let's give God praise and thanks. You at home, just lift up your voice and clap your hands along with us. And let's magnify God for the wonder of his word, the goodness of his word to us. We praise you, Lord God, for the privilege of handling your word in this house tonight. And everyone said amen. Praise God. So we were working with this uh, last uh, last Wednesday night. But tonight we want to take a, a diversion away from just the simple surface story of the anointing on David and the anointing on Saul and rather look at the business of higher values or highest values and the graduated system of uh, the hierarchical nature of values and the fact that this young man, Abishai, felt like he was absolutely in the will of God and he incorporated scripture and he justified his action and if you had quizzed him on this a hundred times he would have told you a hundred times that it was the will of God to strike Saul dead there on the floor of that cave and he was wrong and if the first chapter of 2 Samuel teaches us anything it teaches us that if he had killed Saul David would have killed Abishai because he laid his hand against the anointed of God and he didn't know and he didn't understand 
But what we're looking at here is a juxtaposition of values, and uh, it bears some uh, contemplation. And, and so you have David, who is the anointed of God, and you have Saul, who is the anointed of God, and, and they're polar opposites on the continuum of anointing because one is on his way out and one is ascending into the full-blown power and authority of God. And, and uh, it's such is the nature of the kingdom of God. People are always coming in and people are always leaving. God bless those that have the tenacity to stay in the covenant of God. And uh, though you be few and far between, the Bible says that many will seek to enter therein and won't be able to. So you need to set your heart toward those things, those disciplines or those, those uh, values that are going to help you live for God in the durative. You're going to be here when the dust settles. Does anybody already have a made-up mind that you're going to be here when the trump sounds? Praise God. So David is, uh, David is ascending and David is growing and Saul is backsliding and declining, but he yet has the anointing of God because the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God will let you take the power of God and the capacity of God right down to the edge of hell because if you should turn your will away from those things and back to the things of God, you would be equipped to recover and to repent and to make things new and right again. And I'm just telling you, there's never a day that's too late to turn back. I believe with all of my heart that Judas could have turned back and instead of hanging himself, he could have been there on the day of Pentecost. I'm just telling you the mercies of God endure forever and the word of God is true so they're both anointing but they they're holding different sets of values so I in, I infer that the effectiveness of the anointing in your life is going to be uh, in large part contingent on your value system and on what you use as a metric for value and so anointing depends then. Say, well, I've got the Holy Ghost. Well, yes, you do. But how are you going to use it? And how will it prosper you? And how will it benefit you? And how will you walk in it? Saul had the Holy Ghost. And Saul had the anointing. But he was caught up in another value system that wasn't going to work toward the betterment of the kingdom nor his good outcome. So at his at his installation, Saul is hiding among the stuff, and we just kind of laugh at that, and we think, well, Saul uh, is insecure, and he's a little bit shy, and they had to go get him and drag him. This was not his anointing by Samuel. This was his public anointing before all of Israel, and he's hiding, and, and you might say, oh, that's kind of sweet. He's a little bit shy, but that's not sweet. When you're in the kingdom of God, and you're the chosen of God, you can't hide from what God has for you, and you can't say, well, I'm just shy, or I just can't do it. That is the other end of the ego spectrum. Pride and arrogance, you understand, but insecurity and failure to step up to God is on the other end, but it's the same disease and you've got to get it under the blood and you've got to get it under the power of the Spirit and you've got to get it in, 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 in the traces of the Word of God and you've got to show up when it's time to show up and you've got to be there when it's time to be there and you've got to be at that appointment where God wants you to stand before the people of God. He was anointed, but his value system was scored by Ego, he was, and you, it shouldn't come as a shock to you, when Goliath took the field in the Valley of Elah, Saul was hiding with the rest of Israel, and now Israel is hiding with him. So the value system is corrupt, and the value system is save my life, and the value system is, is hold on to my physical body and the value system is don't get in a place where you can get hurt and the value system is protect me at all costs but I'm just going to tell you there are some things in the value system of God that are bigger than me and they're bigger than you and they're bigger than pride and they're bigger than self protection and they're bigger than all of the things that might, might make you want to duck and hide in the value system of God a human life is something that can be spent like 
John the Baptist and like those in the last half of Hebrews chapter 11. His self-preservation is his value. But David, on the other hand, David goes and meets the lion. And David goes and meets the bear. And that's before the formal anointing had come on him. And God saw him. He had a set of values that caused him to be mighty even before Samuel poured that oil on his head. But it was that mindset and that value system that led him running into the battle against that giant. And so, and so there's, there's quite a distinction between these two kings and between these two anointed one and David is David is caught up in a value about God and perhaps about family and about maybe about country or maybe about duty and maybe about honor and all those things are so blended it's so hard to separate all of that sometimes but he's he's all about taking responsibility and and in our text David and Abishai are both really good guys, and they're both covenant people, and they're, they're both seeing the same situation, but their values are different. And for Abishai, it's easy. The enemy of my friend is my enemy. But that's not necessarily so. And you better find out what the value of God is. Because you may find yourself operating at a horizontal level. You may find yourself operating on a level of humanity, which there are some good things and there are some valued things there. But the value of the kingdom is higher and these values are graduated. David values the word of God and he gives it to us. He said, touch not mine anointed nor do my prophets no harm. They, they've got different values and because of that they come to different conclusions and they take or would take different actions your value system will determine what you do it'll determine the state of mind that you're in it'll determine how prone you are to fear and to anxiety what you value will cause you to to succeed in the kingdom of God or fail at your attempt to live for God it matters what is most important to you it matters what you what you value some some values are deeply deeply rooted and they're they're almost down at the biological level they're instinctive and and some are some are learned and they're family values and cultural values and a lot of those attach to things that are wired in you they're they're hardwired in you and you you wonder sometimes how how deeply and how how completely people are possessed by their value systems but it is absolutely it's absolutely the truth. After, in, uh, in, in, in Luke 9, after the miracle of the loaves and after the transfiguration on the mountains, James and John want to call down fire and burn up the Samaritans and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he had go to Jerusalem. Those, those Samaritans wanted him to come because he was doing all these mighty acts and wonderful miracles. But they were upset because they felt about the Jews like the Jews felt about them. And they had for hundreds of years. And, and so when Jesus looked like and they knew he was going to go down to Jerusalem, they, uh, they pretty much rejected him. They did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, now these are the same boys that, that uh, their mama came and said, my sons, they, when you come to your kingdom, one wants to sit on your right hand and one wants to be on your left hand. He said, lady, you have no idea what you're asking because they, they were asking about when he came into his kingdom, but there was a stop along the way, which was going to be on the top of Golgotha. And they were asking to be the two that were crucified on either side of Jesus. And and Jesus said, you have no idea what you're asking. But here, same James and John, they saw this. They said, Lord, will you that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? And now they've got faith. And they believe the word of God. And they've got a biblical template. And they feel offended for their master, who they are convinced is the Christ. But they've gotten their manhood and their ego all mixed up in that. And they think 
that some people are, are dispensable. They think that some people can be written off. But Jesus opens up a value to them. They weren't aware. He turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are. You have no idea what value system you're representing here. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. He said, look, come here, come here. Look up. There's a higher value. There's something above where we're standing. Your meager human experience and your anger and your offense and your resentment. Don't be striking out real quickly. You're representing your own pride and your own arrogance. You, you need to consider how will God act in this and what does God think about this? And he said, he said God came to, 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 to give people life, to save them. And they went to another village in the 16th chapter of Matthew, Peter had just received the keys to the kingdom. An astonishing revelation that we love to quote today on this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he said, you are Peter, small stone. And upon this rock, he said, this rock like the rock of Gibraltar, I'll build my church. And he said, to you I'll give the keys of the kingdom. And he said, Peter, whatever you bind on the earth is going to be bound in the heavens. Whatever you loose is going to be loosed in the heavens. It's in the same chapter, in the same immediate time span. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him. You get the impression he put his hands on him, took him, and began to rebuke him, began to correct God, saying, and you, you have to think when you, when you read this of the verse that says, and Peter not knowing what to say, said, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. God just told you the word of God. God just told you what was going to happen. God just gave you the keys for the maintaining of his kingdom in the earth. And you're going to stop and you're going to tutor God on who should be president and what the tax structure could be like and what the nation should, should have as its destiny and what should happen in other people's lives. Believe you me right now, you've got enough to do in your own little life circle without trying to be God in someone else's circle. I don't care how they run the district and I don't care what they're doing down the road. I've got plenty to do right here in my own life and in this house of God. You've got a ministry. You've got a life. You need to focus on that. You know why you focus on other things? Because it's easier than doing the heavy lifting of changing your own life. Let's clap our hands and bless his name and lift him up. Hallelujah. Peter took him, shook him, I didn't say shook him, and began to rebuke him. I want to be adding to the word of God. Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter, if he doesn't do this, you can't be saved, and nothing else matters. And so you've got the value of my friend's life and this association and the ministry and the, and the people and maybe the resurgence of Israel and maybe the throne of the Messiah, but there's a higher, there's a higher value. You've got to lift up your eye. You've got to see the fact that God is going to redeem mankind. There's something up the food chain. There's something up the hierarchy of God, and you've got to catch that in your vision because it'll help you distill everything that's happening. You'll get caught up in the events of the day, and you'll lose your mind, and you'll find yourself contradicting God. God. And he said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. And he calls him just after he gave the guy the keys to the kingdom, he calls him Satan to his face. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. 
You're valuing friendship, and that's a good value. You're valuing brotherhood, and that's a good value. You're valuing uh, the social connection, and those are good things. And maybe a, a litany of things that Peter is valuing there. And in a, in a certain sense, you might find Peter's defense of him admirable, but it's not. You've got to hear Jesus when he says that is of the devil. When you stand against or in opposition to the word of God, that is of the devil. So it doesn't matter if it's about the economy. It doesn't matter if it's about the political sphere. It doesn't matter if it's about anything that might be major in your natural life. If it contradicts the word of God, you want to be found standing over here. If you're standing all by yourself, stand with the word of God. If you're standing without any friends, stand with the word of God. If it makes you a pariah, stand with the word of God. Don't wait for the applause of man. Get into a place where you can hear the applause of God. Peter took him, rebuked him. It's not going to happen. Get behind me, devil. You're an offense to me. You value the things of men, not the things of God. Then said Jesus to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And part of that is the falling away of those values, of those precious things, those things that you've staked some importance on. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? And lose his soul. I can't read that without thinking about Kenny Avery. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It's, a, it's about your value system. So Peter's well taught and he means well. But he's so tangled up in the values of his world. Like good things, like group. You need a group. Like family. You need a family family, like tribe. You need a larger extended group. You, I mean, church family is like that, and you need to love your church family. But you, you hear me. You've got to be able to do this. You have to be able to stand entrenched in the word and in the value system of God and see above all the humanity around you, regardless of the relational dynamic. You have to be able to see the value system of God. And so some of this is really wired in, and it's very, very important to us. And it's, and it's Peterson, if we were studying him, he would say it's an evolutionary dynamic. It's biological. But we would say this is in us by creative design. It's in us because it's the way God made us, and it's real, and it's powerful. And, uh, and we've got to be able to navigate these things. You know, you, you have an allegiance to to your point of origin. You can't help it. You just can't help it. When good things happen in your town, you're feel good about it. You're proud of it. If you're from Alabama and good things happen to Alabama, you're happy about that. Not just because you, you live here, but there's some group thing going on there about that. And, and if it happens that the United States has a win or does something notable or has a victory or something good happens, you feel good about that. It's an extension of your, your value of community and, and those things are wired into you. And it, it, when you get down to the area of patriotism, it's a powerful thing. People die for these things. People lay down their lives for their friends and lay down their lives for their families and their communities. And that's no small thing. And there are times when that might be a necessary sacrifice. But, but as, we're, as we're laying values out, and you could do that for quite a while, it's very, very clear that some of them work better than others. And they produce in lives, they produce better lives. How do you tell a value is a good value? Well, it produces something better. How do you tell a value is a crummy value? Well, it wrecks people's lives and you get bad outcomes and you think that that would be very clear, but it's not nearly so clear as it might be because people go to repeating those things and, and they repeat history and they repeat the, 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 the 
mistakes and the failures of their parents and their grandparents. And that's when you hear about the thing about, about a, a generational curse. But I'm going to tell you right now, there is no such thing as a generational curse. You may have a, a physiological proclivity or a predisposition toward alcoholism or addictive behavior, but there's no such thing as that thing is on you and you can't get away from it. Friend of mine, you can stand up. There is nothing. We heard somebody prophesy about that uh, on, uh, that was such a perfect answer, Mallory. Perfect answer. My wife and I were talking about that. Yeah, we see the problems and yeah, we see the backsliders and yeah, we feel a little bit dismayed about the probability of their being able to come back but I hear the pleading voice of God saying don't you know my blood still works that was beautiful that was that was perfect that was absolutely perfect if you're still if you're feeling like that right now about anything I want you to just say the blood still works if you're worried and you're worried that they're not going to come back, you just say the blood still works. If your heart is being affected by the fact that you believe that they might not come back, you need to stand and say the blood still works. You need to say the word still works. You need to say God's ways still work. God's values or good values in culture produce, produce a better culture. And in, in, in every area, in economies and marketplaces, and, and the, the value systems, good values tend to be transcultural and transhistorical. They tend to work in every generation, and they tend to work in every place and in every culture. The kingdom of God is like that. It's really difficult to arrive at a metric, though, for gauging and, and, and measuring and, 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 and trying to assess the, the, uh, the effectiveness of different values. But I, I've got something for you tonight. The, the Word of God is our metric to value in total. The Word of God is the ultimate final metric. If it is good, it's good by the Word of God. If it is desirable, it's desirable because the Word of God says so. If it'll work, it'll work because the Word of God says so. And if you have two that are laid one next to the other, like a, a king on a cave floor and a king standing by you and an anointing here and an anointing there and people of good will and they, they are so vast vastly separated in their approach to this situation. And it, I'm talking about something that is real in your navigating of everyday life. Every day is going to bring you things you've got to make decisions about and positions you have to take and people you have to embrace or turn away from and decisions all, all of your life. And the Word of God is the metric by which you make those decisions. It'll help you navigate life successfully and in the spirit and so we pray thy kingdom come your way god thy will be done your way god not my way not an organization's way not the city's way not the government's way and sometimes those things move together and sometimes they intersect and sometimes they are in alignment but friend of mine if I'm going to navigate life successfully I've got to know what thus saith the word of God because the word of God is the bastion of the value system of God praise God everybody say thy will be done Praise God. And so kingdom values, or the values of the kingdom of God, they persist and they, they're good for, for all seasons and short-term term outcomes and long-term outcomes. And, and it's because God's metric is the word of God. And, and that's what we want. We, wanna, we want to know the highest value. We want to discover and we want to get oriented to that highest value. How many of you read Frankel or studied Frankel when we were in the middle of that? Or how many of you have taken that little tiny book down off the shelf and you've read it? If there's a punchline in man's search for meaning, it is simply this, that he survived and others survived the death camps of Nazi Germany because they found something they could lift up their eyes to, a higher thing, a more important value, a purpose, a reason bigger than themselves 
themselves and it made the difference in life and death. I want you to know you need, you don't need to think you have everything right now and you don't think that you're complete right now and you always need to start your day by looking up and saying, my Father who art in the heavens, our Father who art in the heavens, I'm standing here and God, you bless me and I'm glad for where I am and I'm glad for what you've done but I know there's something higher than this and today to start my day the Egyptians used to look as far as the sun but I'm looking higher than that and he brought Abraham out to look at the stars but I'm looking higher than that because his throne is above the stars I want you to know that you need to lift up your eyes and look toward what God has and incrementally and maybe, maybe by doing that, you get a glimpse of something a little bit better. And what my heart says today is, I want to get better today. I want to be stronger today. I want to see more clearly today. I want to hear what that looks like in the kingdom of God. I can't make the whole journey today. And by the way, by the time we get to the end of the journey and we've done our very, very best, he says, just consider yourself an unprofitable servant. And Paul said, and Paul saw so clearly, but Paul says, we just see through a glass darkly. And he said, I, I speak like a child and I think like a child. He said, but boy, when that day comes, when that moment comes, because it's so much higher than us. But that's the way by looking up and by seeking after that, I get incrementally, incrementally to the higher to the higher, to the stronger, to the more perfect, to that more clarified thing. And, and then when I look down, I can navigate these things in a far stronger, more purposed, more definitive way. I, I can make my way through life and I make better decisions and I have better outcomes. It depends on your, on your value system. It depends on what you, what you value the most. So Jesus, Jesus gave overarching commandments. Uh, a lawyer asked him the question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. And so this is the holistic first commandment, the Shema Israel. It is God is one, and you need to be totally holistically invested in him. Now, that is focused on him to the, uh, to the detriment of every other relationship around you. Uh, uh, you Antoine, you love your little wife there? You do with all of your heart? Okay, but if she turns against God, bye. Yeah, and it, it has to be like that. It has to be like that. I, I love my wife, but we, we made a covenant a long time ago. You leave, you're leaving by yourself. You leave, you're leaving by yourself, but I'm going to live for God. You've got to understand that that. You've got to love God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your, all of your strength. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, that is a high idea. And sometimes we get that and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we, we walk around in the shallows regarding that. And we feel it and feel the power of it. But he said the whole law is, well, why did he bother giving us all the other commandments, Old and New Testament? It's because we don't know how to navigate that, love God and love people, uh, just those two things. If, he said if you got it, you would have the rest of it. But we don't have it. And it's almost impossible so he has to give us what the what the fruit of the spirit looks like and what walking in the spirit looks like and and all of these stories about how do we handle it, this situation and that situation that's what all these little stories are they're people acting out and living out the story of their lives our story our life is a story told the the, the proverbs say and so the the beatitudes are a, a sample of kingdom values and I'm in I'm in the Beatitudes with at least two uh, couples right now we're walking through those I do that on the on the page in the Bible study with the uh, happy people and the sad people the sad people are in the dark and the happy people are in the light and they all look like apostolics because I don't think the artist could draw anything but apostolics uh, and uh, <laughs> 
but it's a great page to go through the Beatitudes. And we just start in chapter 5 and make our way all the way through chapter 7. You say, why in the world do you do that? Because at that point, most of them have the Holy Ghost. Most of them have been baptized in Jesus' name. And now we need to talk about the value system of the kingdom of God. Because they can't go back out on the job or in their home and walk in those old values anymore. They have to come to school and learn how to be the people of God and walk with these new attitudes and these new these new value systems in their lives. And so in um, Matthew chapter 6, we'll just kind of jump in the middle of the Beatitudes. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. So is he teaching against savings? Is he teaching against preparing for the winter? Is he teaching against having something for a rainy day? No, no. The, the value system of the Word of God is very clear. Proverbs 21, there's a treasure to be desired, an oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. And so the, uh, the admonition is you keep something for the rainy day. You keep something. You never live beyond your means. You don't even live down to the edge of your means. You always live beneath your means. The Bible says that that's wisdom. Now, you may value the trinkets and the baubles and the better this and the newer that, but you need to look at that budget and you need to say, this is a value from the Word of God. And so I'm restricted in where I can live and what I can drive and what I can wear and what I can eat and if I eat out and all of those things. I'm restricted. Well, no, no, I got plastic in my pocket. I can do all that. Yeah, and you're spending tomorrow for a, a sacrifice. You're spending tomorrow and sacrificing it on the altar of today. You need to learn how to save. Well, the Bible says, lay up your treasure in heaven. I don't have to save anything here. You're not reading this right. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, not your aunt. The ant. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide and no overseer, no ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. And he said, look at nature all around you. They store up. They work feverishly, storing up. And so you need to be storing up. Well, doesn't that contradict what he said about treasure on earth? No, not at all. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. He, he stores so much that it's a blessing to his children, and then it's a blessing to his children's children. That's the, the target. That's a value of the word of God. So you need to be effective and you need to be productive and you need to be saving and you need to be living beneath your means. Now you would shout if I was talking about, if you come down right now, you'll get a blessing and God will multiply your storehouse. You're getting giddy just talking about that right now. But I'm just telling you where you are right now. The better you do this, the better your storehouse is going to look. So... So what does he mean? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He's not saying don't save and don't store on earth. He's saying don't love that and focus on that and let that be your priority. But he said let's start stocking up some treasures in the heavens where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where, ne where thieves do not break through and steal. And where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Praise God. And, and there you understand where Paul is when Paul says, I have abounded and I've been abased, but I've learned in everything therein to be content. He said, it doesn't matter what I have here. It doesn't matter because my treasures are stored up in the storehouse of God. Somebody say amen. So I'm going to be effective. I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to be a good worker. I'm going to be a good employee. I'm going to be uh, frugal and thrifty and honest. That's what temperance is in the financial discussion. It's, uh, it's you don't spend, you, you, you build your life and you build your skill and your craft and you, and you make something of yourself in this world so that you'll be able to be a blessing to others and you stock up something for your children and for your, and for your grandchildren. But make sure that that's not where your heart is. But your heart is over on the other side. Your heart is attached to that higher value. Where your heart is, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so this is the focusing on the higher 
value. And it goes on there in Matthew 6. The light of the body is the eye. The way you see things. Well, how do you see things? You see things based on your value system. You see things based on your on the things that you treasure, the things that you think are important. That's how you see the world around you. You you value people. You see people. If you walk right by and you look right through people, you don't value people. You're 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 got you've got your mind on something else altogether. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, if it is focused, if it is singular in its intent and in its value system, thy whole body shall be full of light. So what is that singular thing then that I need to focus my eye on? Well, it's that highest spot that you can see. It's that highest thing that you can perceive in the kingdom of God. And then you set your eye, you set your goal on that. And by doing so, and, and this is what Jesus meant. He said the highest commandment, love God with all of yourself and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can, if those are the highest, then you can focus on those. And as you navigate life, you're going to inevitably do those things that are consistent with those commandments. The light of the body is the eye. And if your focus is single, if you're focused on the things of God, your body will be full of revelation and knowledge and understanding at the entrance of thy word there is light and light will flood you and fill you and you'll have understanding about the basic things of life and the things of God but if thine eye be evil and so to juxtapose it with that 22nd verse if your eye is evil then it's the contrasting point from being single your eye is evil it's all over the place it's not focused on the high thing it's not desiring the higher value it's it's down here in the gutter and it's down here in the low places and it's concerned about these things down here if your eye is evil your whole body will be full of darkness no illumination no revelation no understanding no wisdom if therefore the light that is in thee is darkness how great is that darkness and it has to do with your value system what you perceive and how you perceive uh it's it's like uh, Tim, do you value your little wife? Huh? What? It'd be a good time to stand and say, I do, I value her above all the heavens and the earth, above every living thing. But that was good. What you said was good. That's right. It was the affirmative. It was, it was good. Um, you, know, you know how we tell you value her? How can I tell you, value her? Because you said that just now? I, this is an honest, true story. Guy beats his wife with a chair leg. Sends her to the hospital that night. Is standing out on the curb outside the hospital crying. And blubbering about how much he loves her. And I really want it, I want him to hate me. Because if that's love, if a chair leg is love, well, that's the extremity, isn't it? You know, so we know he doesn't love anybody. He didn't understand the concept. But we understand your devotion to her and your value of her by what you do, by how you walk it, by how you live it. And that's how God gauges our values and all you have to do is stop for a minute and look at what you're doing and how you're doing it how you're treating people how you're handling money how you're dealing with the things of God how you approach the house of God and you you got to take this and there's a million moving parts you, you could talk tonight about the word of God and worship and prayer and consecration and holiness and doctrine and the people of God and uh, how we socialize with the people of God, how we treat the people. There's a million moving parts to that, but every one of them is affected by how I value the things of God and by what value system I'm operating under, what flag I'm flying over my life. No man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So here the example is money, and a lot of the conversation here is about money. But this is generalized 
uh, this is something that, that is applicable to almost every area of life. You can't serve God's value and this lowly value at the same time. You can't serve God's value. You can't serve David as my friend, and so I'm going to defend my friend and lay your hand against the anointed of God. You've got to break from that friend if he's, if he's insistent on you stepping outside the framework of the Word of God. Somebody say praise the Lord. I, uh, I, I want to I value your friendship, and I want to love you as a brother or sister in the Lord. But I've just got to tell you, I've made a decision a long time ago, and I've already walked away from a lot of people. And I'll walk away from you in a heartbeat if you turn your back on the things of God, and you become a noxious influence in the house of God, or you try to lay your hand against the people of God. You, I'm telling you, this is as serious as a heart attack. David killed the guy that killed Saul. He would have killed Abishai right there on the spot. And I'm just going to tell you, I love you. I want to be your brother. I love you. I want to be your friend. I love you. I want to be your pastor. But you and I are going to part ways if you've got a hostile attitude about the Word of God, the things of God, the promise of God, the doctrine of the Word of God, any of these things that God has put together and delivered to us to save our souls. Praise God. Well, praise God. So I've got to stop because it's 830. So could I get a little music? Sam, a little music. Don't worry about praise group coming up because we're not going to do a, a, a serious altar call here. But I want you to stand. If you're in your house tonight, I want you to think in terms of I need to look at my life, watch my life. My life will tell me what my values are. And what is most important to me. And then I need to look up. I need to start my day by looking up. I need to develop a capacity in my life for looking up. And I need to find, I need to find the, the value system of God. I need to dive into the metric of the Word of God. And read those Beatitudes. And, and, and he, says, he says, don't strike back. Turn the other cheek. He said, don't turn them away if they're in need. He says, he says, he says, if you call your brother Raka, empty-headed, you're in danger of the council. If you say thou fool, you're in danger of hellfire. It's like, be real careful. I want to tell you something. And some of you don't even know that you're a part of the United Pentecostal Church. Because we don't do organizational stuff. I told you the other night that we're going to host the men's conference for the United Pentecostal Church in Alabama. And I'll guarantee you, you had some folks saying, what's that? What is that? And I don't care if you know that. I love those guys. I talked to some of them this week. I bear them all the best. I hope they have outrageous success in life and in the kingdom of God. I hope they thrive and I hope they prosper. I want them to, I want them to achieve and I want them to have revival. But I'll, I'll just tell you this. I can't walk with you if you're bickering and fussing and chewing people up and undermining men that are doing their best and women that are trying to live for God. I have no, I have no tolerance for that. I can't walk with you in that. You and I aren't going to be able to, to be yoked together. We're not going to be able to walk together fussing and fighting like a, I, I, I don't want to denigrate anybody by making a comparison. So just fussing and fighting. I, uh, these things are serious. You know, this church, we've heard prophecy. Brother Stephen, when you were uh, inviting people to come the other night, I tend to acquiesce and I tend to, especially at this aged part in my life, I, I'm getting ready for the rocking chair. But I thought I'd come and I'd sit right here 
and that I would say we're sitting in a miracle right now. God promised us in prophecy this building 20 years ago and we are standing and sitting in a miracle of prophecy right now. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful and the capacity for that is extraordinary. But that's not the end of the prophecy because as many times as we heard that, we also heard out of the mouth of out of the mouth of Nate Wilson and out of the mouth of Morel Cornwell, out of the mouth of Greg Godwin, we heard God's going to double this church in one revival. God's going to double this church in one revival. God's... Just look around. Look at what he did. And know this, that a barn is of no value without a harvest and this is a barn and the harvest is on the way somebody give him some praise and magnify him right now god wants you to up your game god wants you to look a little higher God wants you to be a better representative of the calling and the kingdom of God. God wants you to walk in a higher train of value. Oh, let's give him a little high praise. Let's magnify. Let's bless his name. Let's worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Young lady, listen to me. Don't put all your energy and all your passion into looking for a feller. Lift up your eye above the fellers. Catch a glimpse of that high value of God. If we continued in that sixth chapter, we would come upon verse 33, and it would say, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these other things. The fellers and the young ladies will be added unto you. Find that high place. Church, let's reach up and get a little more in God. Let's reach up. It's a brand new year. Let's be better when we turn this corner next year than we are right now. Let's be deeper and wider and stronger and wiser than we are right now. Hallelujah. Don't, don't get sidetracked by a bobble or a bangle or a shiny new thing. Or... Those things are so... These worldly things that people get hung up on... They are so passing, so empty. Brother Randy, I was at Piggly Wiggly early Monday or Tuesday morning. And I'm walking in. Now, I love my Piggly Wiggly because it has an Ace hardware in it. And even if I don't get something there, I can at least go buy it and think about things I could get. But I'm walking in Ace Hardware, and I'm hearing, dang, 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 da -da 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 -da. And it's Eric Clapton, and it's Mountain, and it's Mississippi Queen. Do you know what I mean? And I'm 18 in the frozen food section. And I'm seeing guys with hair down the here and bell bottom jeans. That's why they play that boomer music in those places anyway. But I just stopped and I started laughing. I heard I heard three or four songs. I kept going around so I could hear more stuff. 
I heard three or four songs by the time I left the milk section and got to the Ace Hardware over on the other side. And I thought, that was so trendy, so absolutely powerful, trend setting, cutting edge. It was, it was, it was like Motown. It was like in that season for, for us. It was like, it was like the music of our life. It was, and now it's music in Piggly Wiggly. Be careful. The fads, the fashions, the music, you hear me listen. I don't want to import that and bring it in here. I want you to get down on your face in front of God. Where's Lindsay? I want you to get on your face before God. And I want God to breathe some music into you. I don't want to sound like the latest thing coming out of Nashville or Hollywood or New York. And you don't want to be watching those things. And you don't want to be captured by those things. Because one day those things are just going to be background at the cheese department at Piggly Wiggly. But a song like the old rugged cross and a song like Amazing Grace, those songs are going to arch over generations and touch people in altars for as long as there's a church on the face of the earth. Somebody say praise the Lord. Don't let your eye get hook, hooked up on values here because the anointing of God will be standing right by you and you may be about to make the biggest mistake in your life because you are operating on earthbound values and you might kill the very anointing that God sent to be a blessing to you. My God, I love you. Glad to be in the house of God with you tonight. I'm 10 minutes over. Let's clap our hands and lift our voices and magnify Him. Hallelujah. We give you praise, oh God. We magnify you, oh God. Glory to God. Praise God. God bless you. Love and bless somebody. We'll have church on Sunday. Remember to be here 7 o'clock Friday night. We're going to have communion.